The House will come to order. Today's pledge will be led by Jacob and Rivka Young of Christian Home Educators of Colorado, representatives of Gabe Evans of House District 48. Please join us with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, so much. thanks so much for being here. Appreciate you guys. And we have one more special treat this morning. We have some additional guests of Representative Gabe Evans who are going to lead us in the national anthem. Please join us and look to this direction. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for singing for us this morning. Mr. Schiebel, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile. Armagost. Bacon. Bird. Rep Bockenfeld is excused. Basenecker. Bottoms. Bradfield. Bradley. Brown. Catlin. Clifford. Doherty. Representative Doherty. DeGraff. Degree Kennedy. Duran. Majority Leader Duran. English is excused. Epps. Evans. Frizzell. Froelich. Garcia. She's here. Hamrick. Hartsook. Hernandez. Herod is excused. Holtorf. Judah. Joseph. Representative Joseph. Kip. Leader. Lindsay. Linstead. Luck. Here. Lukens. Lynch. Mabry. Rep Mabry. Excused. Marshall. Martinez. Marvin. Morrow. McCormick. McLaughlin, Ortiz, Excused. Parenti, Puglisi, Ricks, 
Representative Ricks. Excused. Rootnell. Sirota. Snyder. Soper. Rep Soper. Excused. Story. Taggart. Titone. Valdez A. Velasco. Excused. Vigil. Weinberg. Weissman. Excused. Wilford. Wilson. Winter. Representative Winter. Excused. Woodrow. Young. And Madam Speaker. Excused. With 51 present, zero uh, absent, and 14 excused, we do have a quorum. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are on the fourth county of District 59 today. Montezuma County has 14,000 ancestral Pueblin sites, some dating back to 300 BC. The county is known for Mesa Verde National Park. I don't know if any of you have been there, but you should home to Anasazi ruins, ancestral cliff dwellings, an archeological museum, and incredible vistas. Come learn about a little known history. I move the journal of Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 to be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Thank you. You have heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the journal and the motion is adopted. Announcements and introductions. Representative Frizzell. Members, please take your seats. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. It is an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you as well. Members, please take your seats if you're not in the queue to make an announcement. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. I have a tribute this morning and ask that it be read at length. The Senate and House of Representatives convene in the 74th General Assembly hereby mourns the loss of Greg A. Fugate. Greg Fugate enjoyed many accomplishments during his 50 years, but perhaps his greatest gifts to the world were his warm presence, humorous wit, and enduring patience to capture the perfect moment of composition and light in his award-winning landscape photographs. Greg was born in Leadville, Colorado, and grew up in Idaho Springs, Colorado, as the oldest of three sons. He earned a bachelor's degree from Knox College in Illinois and a master's degree from the University of Colorado. Greg spent 22 years of his professional career at the Colorado Office of the State Auditor, working his way up from an entry-level performance auditor to the director of communications and quality assurance. Greg prided himself, as, prided himself on producing high quality work and he cultivated a reputation for being an abundant resource of knowledge about auditing and state government. He served on the executive committees of both the National Legislative Program Evaluation Society and National Conference of State Legislatures. During the last decade of his life, Greg spent many days in Utah's Red Rock country producing the nature photographs that became his passion, earning him several awards from the Professional Photographers of Colorado. During the summer of 2023, Greg summited Angel's Landing, a challenging hike that brought him great pride. Greg was a dog lover and rescued several dogs, including his beloved Arlo. He enjoyed spending time with family, especially during the holidays, summer camping trips, and vacations at Lake Powell. One of his more personal photo albums chronicled more than 40 years of family vacations houseboating on Lake Powell, a tradition that spanned four generations of Greg's family. With the passing of Greg Fugate, the state of Colorado has lost a true champion of government accountability, and the General Assembly expresses their heartfelt condolences to his family and many friends on their tremendous loss. On request of representatives Lisa Frizzell, Andrew Basenecker, Gabe Evans, and William Lindstedt, and Senators Rhonda Fields, Daphna Michael Sinjane, Rod Pelton, and Kevin Van Winkle, given this 11th day of April 2024, State Capitol, Denver. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. 
First, um, I would like to acknowledge Greg Fugate's parents, his Jean and Nelson, his brother Jeff and sister-in-law Lisa sitting over um, in the corner who have joined us for this tribute this morning, as well as our very own state auditor, Carrie Hunter. A portion of her staff, the state audit auditor's staff, has also joined us um, to represent the coworkers and, and, and their other family members who are watching virtually. I'd just like to say a few notable items about Greg. I'd like to thank my fellow Legislative Audit Committee members from the House for joining me up here today. It means a great deal. Greg was a really integral part of the government audit and program evaluation community in Colorado and nationally as well. During his 22 years with the Office of the State Auditor, he worked on more than 30 performance audits, which if you've ever um, gotten to haul one of those puppies around, they are extremely detailed um, and, and thorough. And to do 30 of them, I can't even imagine. Greg helped establish the OSA's fraud hotline team and the OSA's processes around it. He helped establish the OSA's formal quality assurance and communications function and was serving as the director of communications and quality assurance at the time of his passing. Greg participated in peer reviews throughout, through the National State Auditors Association and the National Legislative Program Evaluation Society, assessing the quality of audit organizations in other states. He completed his last peer review of the Georgia State Auditor's Office just a few days before his cancer diagnosis. Greg always pursued ongoing improvements throughout state government and within the OSA and he was proactive in taking lead roles in all of these efforts. He was a cheerleader for fellow staff members and would put down anything he was working on to listen and provide support. This is a very close-knit group in, in the Office of the State Auditor, and I, I know from my work with them how, how hard they, they, they strive to serve the citizens of Colorado. Greg felt strongly about volunteering to help others. For example, he volunteered at Project Angel Heart and organized community service days there for OSA staff. At the request of the Office of the State Auditor, on Greg's 50th birthday on October 13, 2023, right before he passed, the Colorado and US flags here at the Capitol were flown in his honor and in recognition of his 22 years of service to the state of Colorado. Greg was a shining light within the OSA and to all of his many friends and family members, and Greg will be very greatly missed. Members, thank you so much for your attention this morning. Thank you, Representative Frizzell. We will now continue with announcements and introductions. Representative Amable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Business and labor will not be meeting today. Woohoo! Representative Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. House Finance will be meeting in room 112 at 1.30 to hear seven bills, 1312 for action only, House Bills 1436, 1434, 1373, 1352, 1153, and Senate Bill 18. Thank you. Representative Kipp. Thank you, Energy and Environment members. We will be meeting today at 1.30 p.m. in the old Supreme Court chamber, so not across the street today, old Supreme Court. We only have two bills on our agenda. We have 1346 for action only and one Senate Bill 150. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Education Committee, we are hearing 1310-1363 today um, at 1.30. Thanks. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you as well. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I, I wanted you to meet some people who are very special. Some folks from Montrose, Colorado are here as part of their leadership training. Uh, we try our best to train new leaders over there so that they can build the bench. There's a good bunch of them over here. In fact, part of our community's 
cent uh, city council, youth city council, participates with our city council. If you would greet them for me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Representative Bradfield and Representative Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, the halls are of the Capitol are just absolutely buzzing today with lots and lots of young people. And today is uh, the homeschoolers day at the Capitol. So if you see some of them around, tell them hi and uh, wish them a great day. Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is a privilege to welcome young people to the Capitol at any time, but I, I want to call out the passion and commitment these families make to providing a quality education. Welcome. Thank you. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Members, House Appropriations will be meeting tomorrow morning in the Old State Library at 7.30, which is different than what is in your printed calendar, but we will be meeting at 7.30 tomorrow a.m. to hear the bills listed in your calendar. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. And uh, members, the JBC and the conference committee convened for House Bill 1430 will be meeting again as the first conference committee um, to continue our work. So just putting that out there, we will be continuing our work today. Representative Evans. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. And uh, members, as you heard in that sneak preview, today is the 30-year anniversary of Homeschool Day at the Capitol. Uh, as you probably noticed, we've got a lot of homeschoolers here. This is a particularly meaningful day to me because in uh, case you didn't remember, I was homeschooled all 12 years here in Colorado. <clears throat> And so with that, I want to make a uh, particularly special introduction on the floor with me today. I have a uh, teacher who also happens to be my mom, uh, Becky Evans, formerly Chavez. And I, I also have a, a classmate. For you non-homeschoolers, that means a sibling. Uh, my brother, Isaac Evans. And uh, if you can't see uh, the good rep from the San Luis Valley, you got up your hairdo game there, man. <laughs> the gallery is full of homeschoolers. We also have a couple of folks, in case you're wondering, yes, homeschools actually do also have school boards sometimes. So we have a couple of school board members here representing the homeschool community, um, John Arsenault and uh, George Seacrest. And then we've got the galleries full of homeschoolers today. So just wanted to throw out a couple of quick things about homeschool because I got asked all of these questions growing up. And so I think it's important that we, as part of the introduction, just mention them. Everybody wanted to know when I was a kid, are you socialized? <clears throat> you guys all have heard me talk. You all can answer that question. But... Statistically, homeschoolers participate in over five extracurricular activities every week. So I think, uh, I think we've got the data in on that. And then as far as education, one of the big questions I always got was, does the, the educational attainment of the homeschooling parent matter? And the answer is not really. Regardless of the educational attainment of the parent, from high school all the way up to a doctorate level, homeschoolers typically average 18 to 20 points better than the national average on standardized tests. So in recognition of all of these folks, all of these homeschoolers that are today, if all of the folks in the gallery that are homeschoolers want to stand up to be recognized, you'll have another chance to meet these folks um, on the West Steps. West Steps. They will be on the west steps at noon for a rally. You are all welcome to stop by and help me welcome the homeschoolers to the Capitol today. Hey, 
you get the pink memo? Majority Leader Duran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Let me. That mic doesn't sound like it's working, so thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. One announcement before we get started. Just a friendly reminder that open enrollment started on April 9th, and it will end on April 29th. So now is the time to make any changes to your benefits if you need to. Any questions, please consult with the Accounting Office of Legislative Council. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And with that, the next order of business is third reading of bills. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1158. House Bill 1158. Uh, Madam Majority Leader, excuse me, Mr. Schiebel. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over ho House Bill 1158 to the end of the third reading calendar. Uh, seeing no objection, House Bill 1158 will be laid over until the end of the third reading calendar. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 172. Senate Bill 172 by Senator Pelton B. Also Representative McLaughlin concerning changing the phrase industrial hemp product to the phrase hemp product in the statutes that regulate marijuana. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 172 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 172 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Frizzell, Garcia, Judah, Parenti, Story, Taggart, Wilson. Representative Taggart is excused and owes the fine jar $5. Please close the machine. With 59 ayes, zero no, six excused, Senate Bill 172 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 177. Senate Bill 177 by Senators Malika and Simpson, also Representatives Catlin and Story, concerning the authority of History Colorado to dispose of its North Storage facility. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 177 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 177 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Please close the machine. With 59 ayes, zero no, six excused, Senate Bill 177 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1276. House Bill 1276 by Representatives Young and Bradfield, also Senators Enzinger and Lundeen, concerning the continuation of the Colorado Commission for the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deaf Blind, and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations contained in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies and making an appropriation. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1276 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1276 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Please close the machine. 
With 60 ayes, zero no, five excused, House Bill 1276 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1124. House Bill 1124 by Representative Soper and Mabry, also Senators Will and Gonzalez, concerning discrimination in places of public accommodation. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1124 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1124 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Please close the machine. With 43 ayes, 17 no, and five excused, House Bill 1124 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. <clears throat> Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1220. House Bill 1220 by Representative Doherty, also Senator Marchman, concerning disability benefits for workers' compensation injuries and in connection therewith, allowing a claimant to refuse an offer of modified employment under certain circumstances, adding the loss of an ear to the list of whole person permanent impairment benefits, increasing the two aggregate limits on temporary and permanent injury benefits, and requiring the director of the divisions of workers' compensation to ad adjust the limits annually, and requiring a workers' compensation insurer to pay benefits to a claimant by direct deposit upon request by the claimant. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1220 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1220 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Please close the machine. With 42 aye, 18 no, and five excused, House Bill 1220 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please. Close the machine. Members, we are on thirds. I'll ask you to keep your voices down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 26. Senate Bill 26 by Senators Roberts and Will, also Representatives McLaughlin and Catlin, concerning requirement that members of certain state regulatory bodies who are appointed by the governor hold meetings to elicit public engagement and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 26 on third reading and final passage. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Once good again, morning. I want to get up and rise in support of this bill. I think this is a really good bill. Your rural delegation is constantly coming down to the well and trying to tell the story of rural Colorado, agricultural production, our heritage and rural way of life. And this is an opportunity for those in Denver that are involved in government to be able to leave the fishbowl, get out to rural communities, and talk to our constituents to hear directly from them about the issues that they face and the things that they do. And all I urge is, is please don't just listen, hear what these people have to say. So I urge you all, please, for rural Colorado and I vote on this. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 26 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes.
please close the machine. With 60 ayes, zero no, and five excuse, Senate Bill 26 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please <clears throat> close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 161. Senate Bill 161 by Senators Pelt and Arn Marchman, also Representatives Lukens and Soper, concerning parks and wildlife products and in connection therewith, modifying low-income senior and disabled veteran eligibility requirements for certain licenses, authorizing the Parks and Wildlife Commission to establish by rule a harvest permit surcharge and establishing procedures for hearings conducted by the Commission for the denial, suspension, or revocation of a river outfitter license. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 161 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 161 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Please close the machine. With 58 aye, two no, five excuse, Senate Bill 161 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1253. House Bill 1253 by Representatives English and Holtorf, also Senator Janal, concerning the continuation of the regulation of respiratory therapy and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1253 on third reading and final passage. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it would be very appropriate this morning to give Representative English a gift of a green slate on the marquee. So I encourage everybody to vote yes, and we'll take that picture and send it to her as she is involved in the bereavement that she's involved with. So please vote yes, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1253 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Garcia, Kip, and Story. Please close the machine. With 57 I, three no, and five excused, House Bill 1253 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Congratulations. <laughs> Please close the machine. Members, we are on third readings. I will ask you to keep your voices down. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1105. House Bill 1105 by Representative Hernandez, also Senator Gonzalez, concerning the creation of a special license plate to support the Chicano community and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1105 on third reading and final passage. Representative Marshall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm in the, uh, it's a pleasure to serve with you, an honor always to serve with you. It is a pleasure and honor to serve with you. Uh, I sit in the Finance Committee and have a strong policy of voting against all license plate bills for a very good reason, because we wind up picking and choosing. Um, I intend to continue following that policy, but I strongly 
encourage everyone to vote for this license plate because it shows the exact issues that I occur and why I have that policy because this license plate has been turned down before and it shouldn't have been turned down before in the context of all the other license plates we have done. So I would encourage everyone on both sides of the aisle to be careful about picking and choosing what messages we want to send and encourage everyone to be able to send the message they want. If we're going to allow one message, allow it all, uh, or have the view that mine that we should have one state license plate because it's for the state. But if you're going to allow people to send a message, this is definitely one that should be allowed in our state license plate, uh, I don't know, repertoire. So please support it. Thanks. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1105 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Puglisi and Winter. Please close the machine. With 41 aye, 18 no, and six excused, House Bill 1105 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over House Bill 1158 until tomorrow. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1158 will be laid over until tomorrow. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move the following bills be made special orders on Thursday, April 11th, 2024 at 9.46 a.m. House Bill 1351, House Bill 1294, House Bill 1344, House Bill 1377, and House Bill 1232. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the majority leader will be made special orders on Thursday, April 10th, 20, wait, it's the 11th. Thursday, April 11th at 9.46 a.m. Representative Wilford. Members, you've heard the motion. Seeing no objection, Representative Wilford will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon the motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title of House Bill 1351. 
House Bill 1351 by Representatives Amable and Linsett, also Senators Lundin and Priola, concerning the continuation of functions related to banking and a connection therewith, implementing recommendations contained in the 2023 Sunset Report from the Department of Regulatory Agencies for the Division of Banking and the Banking Board. Representative Amable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is a banking sunset bill, and it's... Representative Mopley, I'm going to have you move the bill first, if okay, you don't mind, sorry. please. Well, well done. Okay, I would like to move House Bill 1351. All right, and before I pass it back to you, members... It's okay, we don't need them to listen. <laughs> members... Let's, let's start this off on the right foot. I'm going to ask that you all um, take any conversations off the floor so that we can make sure that our attention is on the speakers. Representative Amable, please continue to the bill. Okay, thank you. So this is the Banking Sunset Bill, and um, <clears throat> it's a must-pass thing because we do want to regulate banking in our state, so I hope you'll all vote yes on it. There is one controversial piece of it, which is that um, DORA and the regulatory agencies, in their infinite wisdom, um, included a provision that will allow credit unions to purchase banks. And this is something that other states do routinely um, and with no ill effect. And um, you'll hear a different perspective on that, I think, later today. But um, in the meantime, I'd like to turn it over to my co-prime. Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to reiterate that the department went through a rigorous uh, public process to come to these regulations, and all of the regulations in the sunset are to protect consumers and have been thoroughly reviewed by stakeholders. Agree or disagree, there, there, is, there is no public interest in changing the recommendations from the department. So I urge a yes vote. Let's continue to regulate uh, state chartered banks here in Colorado. Representative Frizzell. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Members, I would like to speak to this bill which we heard in the business committee, and then again, I believe in finance. Do we hear it in finance? I don't know. Anyway, um, this, this sunset is by and large fine. It's fine and dandy, it needed to happen, it provides some great guidance going forward. However, um, for reasons that are still not clear to anyone, A recommendation was created to allow credit unions to purchase banks. This completely blindsided the banking industry and we are still at a loss to understand who actually requested this recommendation. Um, through this process, I know I have learned a great deal, lots of testimony, lots and lots of testimony on both sides. Um, we have learned that banks and credit unions have a very different regulatory structure. We've learned that banks and credit unions have a very different tax structure. We have also learned that banks and credit unions have a very different compensation structure. And in all cases, all cases, credit unions have advantages over banks regardless of the size of the banks. Also, in testimony, I will tell you members who are listening so intently to my words this morning, that I am really frustrated by the portrayal of corporate banks. Because here's the thing, choice is really important in banking. Not just in Colorado, all across the United States. Whether Members, this is a lot better. Please don't make me gavel again. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I was saying, the portrayal of corporate banks 
was very frustrating because we have to understand that all types of banks are important to our state. It's, they're important, they're critical to the financial health of our state. We have community banks, we have corporate banks that are doing business all across the United States, we have local banks. We need each and every one. Credit unions also play an important part. But it's really important because of the regulatory differences, because of the tax differences between credit unions and banks, it is very important that we kind of keep everybody in their own lane. Um, as such, members, I, am, I would like to move L002 to House Bill 1351 and ask that it be properly displayed. Amendment L002 has been moved and is now properly displayed to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, the ability to run this amendment. Sunsets are important. They play an important role in what we do here. And in this particular case, this sunset bill has been complicated by a matter that actually requires much more analysis beyond the so scope of the sunset process. This is complicated because of the differences between credit unions and banks. So what this amendment does is it strikes recommendation nine in the bill, which is the rec recommendation allowing credit unions to purchase banks. I ask for your aye vote. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you guys for taking on a sunset, which should not be a big darn deal, right? Um, and it shouldn't be, but why do, we, why do we as legislators ever have sunsets come to us for review? I would say it's for this exact purpose, that when we see when a commission is, is outside of its lane and, and maybe taking on more than it should, then that is our job to stand up and say, no, that's not quite right. Um, you know, 90% of this Sunset is, is very appropriate and very necessary and something that we should uh, all be behind and all support. However, it goes a little bit out of the scope when we um, pick out a particular part of that industry and give it favor. That is clearly what this does. Uh, without the full consideration of that being um, considered as a bill, and that's that, this is where the sunset is, is overstepped its bounds. So all this does, this, this amendment removes all of our uh, disgruntledness, is that a word, from this bill. Um, this, this takes out anything that we're opposed to. Everything else in the bill is good. We, uh, we just believe that this is such an important issue that gives a particular sector of the banking industry strategic advantage, and that needs the attention of a bill on its own. This is a great amendment. Please vote yes. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Hartsook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. So we've got an interesting bill here. Regulations, usually by and far, we're not a fan of, but when it comes to banks and credit unions, we need regulations. Why? Because it's people's money. They, they have, it's where we put all of our money. Whether you're a business, a family, or a kid that's starting out with a savings account. Yet the two institutions are very, very different and they serve very different functions, which is great. That's what we want in society. We want choices. We want options. As an individual, I'm a member of both, banks and a credit union. We have accounts in both. On the business side, we have our accounts with banks. They serve very distinct functions that are beneficial to, cons to consumers, but for different reasons. So why would we start muddying the waters by letting there be crossover? I'm a big fan of 
businesses and institu institutions staying in their lane. Credit unions and banks do a great job of their specifics. There's all kinds of distractions up here today. I don't know. <laughs> so they, they serve great functions. And in this state of Colorado, we have the big metro area, but we also have huge agricultural areas. The primary lender in agricultural areas and to agricultural businesses, farms, ranchers, are banks. That's where you go to get your money. When my wife went into private practice, she went to a bank. Why? Because they have a higher loan limit. They have a bigger ability to loan to businesses than credit unions do. Credit unions are great for servicing different kinds of mortgages and other smaller functions, but having the two cross over is not a good idea because now you've got one expertise, whether you're a bank or a credit union, but in this particular case, a credit union that wants to cross over into the banking realm. I love what credit unions do, but I do not want them crossing over into the banking realm. I want them staying in their own lane. If we look at history, about 47 years ago, we had the Community Reinvestment Act. So banks do lots of things in their communities. They do a lot of donations, volunteer work, which from their tax base doesn't get a deduction. They do it because it's the right thing to do. They do it because they want to help their communities. Credit unions, on the other hand, have a whole different tax structure. It applies as far as the IRS is concerned and the tax codes are concerned. It's a completely different way that you treat two financial institutions. Allowing a credit union to, in essence, function as a bank while keeping their tax status as a credit union, I do not think is fair. Businesses should stay in their lanes, do what they do really well. Banks do a great job. Credit unions do a great job. Let's leave that as it is. The sunset bill is okay, but this amendment is phenomenal in taking out that piece, keeping the banks and the credit unions in their own lanes, and then continuing the reg regulation. I absolutely urge an I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Byrd. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And members, I also rise in support of this amendment. Um, the, the sunset, I think, is an important bill that needs to pass. It's important to um, all of the financial institutions that are regulated by this body of law. This piece, however, with respect to who can acquire um, bank assets is actually a substantive piece of policy that merits its own separate consideration. Um, for that reason, I, I'm asking that um, the body support an amendment to take this out so that that issue can be debated separately. Um, this is an issue I've actually had conversations with both banks and credit unions about. I know people feel very passionately about it. There are good arguments all around. I think our credit unions are, are wonderful institutions and um, serve critical functions in our state, as are our banks. Um, and the enabling them to coexist and uh, work and meet the needs of Coloradans is all important. This piece, though, again, it's actually not just a simple quick fix and a change. There's, there are a lot of um, interests and perspectives on this that merit time and their own nuanced policy considerations. So um, I, too, rise in support and ask for a yes vote on the amendment. Representative Mabry. Representative Mabry. Oh, Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I rise, members, to support this amendment. Um, banks purchasing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, credit unions purchasing banks should not be in a sunset report. And in fact, um, in testimony and in the committee, we found out that this was not something that was asked for or recommended um, by, you know, we're not even sure why this is in the sunset report. Um, this is something, as has been said, that is more substantive and out of the realm of what a sunset report should contain. 
is major policy and we should have the right to really consider that on its own. The other thing is that these two, the bank and uh, a credit unions, are two different entities. A bank is, uh, you know, pays taxes. Credit unions do not. They are entities that are nonprofit organizations and cooperatives. So that should not also be in this uh, Sunset Report because we're looking at banking in the sunset. By allowing credit unions to acquire the assets of a bank, we risk diluting the distinct advantages and services that each type of institution offers. Also, when we talk about the CRA, which is the Community Reinvestment Act, we're looking at the different uh, parts of community that these banks have to, by federal law, help. For example, minority and business own, uh, and small businesses that aren't ready to necessarily, you know, go to a bank. These the credit the CRA uh, helps to ensure that banks are funding CDFIs and people who are going to fund like small rural cooperatives, agriculture farmers, and people who probably would not be serviced properly by credit unions. So, for all of those different reasons. I rise in support of this amendment. Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I want to address a few things about this. We have heard that this shouldn't be done in a sunset. There should be a more deliberative process. This legislation has probably had the most deliberation of anything that has come through the Business and Labor Committee because at first during the sunset hearing, everybody came and they said the sky would fall if we let credit unions buy banks, which by the way, I find so ridiculous and I am so frustrated when people come to our committees and they say, hey, if you make this one small change, there's gonna be no lending in agriculture anymore. Even though they do this in Iowa, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of agriculture lending happening in Iowa. Also, another point that I wanna make is that people are acting as if this is a mandate. Credit unions aren't going to have the ability to force a bank to pick them as the buyer. Banks are just gonna pick the most competitive offer. If it happens to be a credit union, so be it. We had experts come to this committee and talk about how this works elsewhere in the country. I think there was a split the first time I asked about this. Somebody said this has only happened eight times ever. And then in the second committee, I said, hey, to one of the bankers experts, I said, hey, this has only happened eight times ever. And sort of incredulously, the guy was like, no, it's happened 70 times. And I'm like, damn, 70 times ever. And the sky is going to fall? I think that People's concerns here are overblown. This has happened 70 times ever. I'll accept what the banker said. 70 times ever in the history of the country. Pretty sure they're still loaning to small businesses everywhere that this is allowed. This is a change that makes sense, and I am opposed to this amendment. Again, I want to reiterate that we have gone through the committee hearing on this bill twice in one chamber. That is more deliberation than most normal bills. So the sunset thing doesn't make any sense to me. We have double deliberated this. Please vote no on this amendment. Representative Bottoms. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And to give an example of why I think this amendment's a legit amendment is, um, my church has been shopping for a loan, a few million dollar loan as of late. And um, all the banks were coming in at the same basic level. Uh, interest rate, the amount they would loan us. And we went to a couple of credit unions, one of the larger credit unions in the state. And uh, the credit union gave us, two credit unions gave us potential for a loan that was quite a few hundred thousand bigger than the banks. And so I sat down with uh, the credit union and said, how do you have the ability to do that? Why, why is everybody else, like 10 banks, the same credit unions are different? And they explained to me the different tax breaks and the tax exempt statuses. So 
So when when we're talking about well, the um, you know they the the banks have the opportunity, the credit unions have the opportunity to um, take the highest bid and things like that. That has to be, that has to be tempered with the reality that they're not on the same playing field. They're not they haven't they don't have the same start. They don't have the same finish, and that credit unions are in a completely different place. And that gives them the ability to be much more competitive in certain situations. And then, by the way, the banks are obligated because of, of, um, of uh, investors. The banks are obligated to take the highest number. And so when, when that kind of thing begins to happen within the banking credit union community, it, it's, uh, it, it, it sets off the balance. Obviously, I believe in credit unions because we're going to take their bid. But... The idea that this, the sunset ideas of this, I think that we think we really just need to look at this amendment, address it, and say, I think this is a legitimate amendment, and um, and it actually helps the bill, it doesn't hurt the bill, and it uh, and it kind of resets the the market, resets everybody's competition here, and uh, gives opportunity for a little more uh, fairness in the process. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, the fact that this has got so much attention should make us give it more attention. That, that statement that, that it's got more attention really says we need to treat this separately. This is a sunset. We just, we just passed one or two of them today. They're not a big deal until they're a big deal. Um, and to correct the record, Iowa has done uh, one sale and then they said, whoops, that was a bad idea and they've gone back on it. So, so that, that is purely false, that agricultural parts of the world are, are doing this. What this clearly does, think about this, if you are somebody that wants to sell their bank and you put that out for offers, you say, okay, who wants to pay me the most money for my bank? That's, th those are shareholders. It is your fiduciary obligation as a member of that bank board to make sure you get the highest dollar for that bank. If one of the bu buyers doesn't pay taxes, doesn't have, to, doesn't have to contribute back to the community, they are obviously in a position to make a better offer. That's picking winners and losers. That's not our job here. All, all we're saying is that this doesn't need to be in this sunset. This is a bigger issue that got rolled into 90% um, of a really good bill. Um, this amendment fixes that. It forces that conversation. And yes, if, we, if it's been heavily debated, well, that must mean something's not right. Because whenever you have a sunset that gets heavily debated, there's something wrong. So. What we need to start doing in this chamber is listening to the people when they come and testify and say there's an issue and then address it, not just say let's roll over it. Nobody in here is against credit unions versus banks. Credit unions do great things. They have a lane. We believe in that lane. We believe that they provide banking services for those that can't necessarily get them other places. But they do not have the, the right to have legislated for them to have a strategic advantage to go into a purchase situation. This amendment fixes this. This amendment forces this conversation to be done um, with more daylight and forces us to really address the issue more thoroughly. It is not our job in here to just rubber stamp everything that comes through from a sunset. This forces that conversation. This is a good amendment. Please vote yes. Representative Lindstead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with all respect to my colleagues uh, up here, I urge a no vote on this amendment. If we want to talk about process, the sunset review went all through the summer with a thorough public process. The department investigated this recommendation and found that there is no public interest in putting state government between a willing seller and a willing buyer in these circumstances. I also want to reiterate that we have had two committee hearings on this exact uh, sunset and this issue. 46 other states allow these transactions to continue. And part of the reason that the department thinks this is a good idea is so that rural banks 
can find buyers. Vote no on this amendment. This idea has been thoroughly vetted, and it is within the interest of the state to allow these transactions to continue. Thank you. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I rise in support to, of uh, Representative Frizzell's amendment uh, to remove Section 9. Uh, the Sunset uh, Report is for the Division of Banking. The Division of Banking supervises state chartered banks. For um, the question as asked, who um, asked for this recommendation? Well, it wasn't the bankers. The only group that profits is the credit union. And it should not then be a sunset. It should be a different, it should be a bill, a different type. Bank and credit union, as this has been said several times, but it deserves to be said another time, that bank and a credit union operate fundamentally different with different principles and different regulations. While banks are profit-driven institutions accountable to shareholders, and credit unions are member-owned cooperatives. By allowing a credit union to acquire the assets of a bank, we risk diluting the distinct advantages and services that each type of institution offer. The acquisition of bank assets by a credit union could lead to unfair competition and market distortion. Banks and credit unions operate in different regulatory frameworks with banks subject to stricter oversight and compliance requirements. Allowing a credit union to expand its operations beyond its traditional scope may create an uneven playing field, disadvantaging other financial institutions and undermining healthy market competition. So for all those many reasons, I urge a yes vote on this amendment. Um, and uh, if we want to do something of merging the two, then make that a bill and not a sunset report. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you as well. Thank you. Members, I'm at the well to this morning because I wanted to bring something from one of my previous lives. I was an ag banker for eight years. And one of the things that we're talking about here today is I think we're missing the point. Banking has different rules in, in regards to what kind of loans we make, what kind of collateral requirements there are, what kind of cash flows and those kind of things. Save Credit unions remind me of old savings and loans. They don't have the same rules. They're really created to help with housing back in the mortgage dairies. There's a great difference between being a commercial bank and being a credit union. And in these rural communities, these state chartered banks are a big part of our communities. And in fact, there's very few credit unions that are in these small communities. So what you're really talking about is having more of a, a presence from the big communities that can support these credit unions coming out into these rural communities and saying, we'll take over for you. Well, in reality, what ends up happening with that is that they're not going to make, end up making the same kind of loans that that commercial bank made. I, I think today we should vote yes on this amendment, take this piece out of, the, out of the bill, and decide we want to look deeply into the idea that credit unions want into the commercial banking industry. 
If that's really what's happening, we need to take a good look at it. We do a lot of studies. We do a lot of, of bringing in all of the constituents and setting down in a room and starting to figure out, can we craft a way to get here? This is one or two lines in a sunset bill for banking, not for credit unions. In fact, I think we did uh, one of these uh, sunset bills for the credit unions. Why didn't that show up in that one? Anyway, I want you to think about this because if you haven't ever gone to a commercial bank to get a loan, it's substantially different than what you go to the credit union because the rules are different, the, the credit requirements are different. This is something we should take a good hard look at in Colorado. And just because other states are thinking about it doesn't mean Colorado is in the same shape they are. Anyway, please vote yes on this amendment. Representative Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I don't come here and speak a lot at the well, but I think it's important to let people know that I was in this committee and this bill, it was discussed at nauseum. And I remember distinctively about how it was presented about the taxes. And one thing that these national banks come in and take the banks and take over the banks and then the money leaves Colorado. And additionally, a lot of people don't realize that these enormous bonuses that they give the banking, bankers' CEOs, they get to write that off in their taxes. And let me tell you, that is a huge amount. And a lot of people don't understand. That's why it's not put into their paychecks. It's a bonus so they can write that off in taxes. And I just wanted to let people know that and that this bill was absolutely discussed for a very a long time. I would agree not to support the amendment and vote for the bill as is. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I received a phone call about a week and a half ago from a constituent out of Walsh, Colorado, who's a president of one of the small rural banks, one of the communities I represent. And what his biggest fear was is, he goes, you know, this can be explained a couple different ways. He goes, there are two sides of this. He's like, you have credit unions that have the best at heart, Christian credit unions, small credit unions that really want to come in and help rule in small banks that might be struggling. But then on the other end, you have large, large credit unions that could step in to our rural banking process and literally buy these banks up, liquidate them, and shut them down and take them out of our communities. And that's really hard because in a lot of, especially these little farming communities, you all would be surprised you'll drive in and there's like 15 houses in a bank because all these farmers need a place to bank in all their little individual communities. So for that reason, I rise in support of this amendment um, and I ask that you support it as well. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a lot of discussion around this bill, House Bill 1351, and it's a very important discussion. I do like this amendment. <clears throat> the amendment, carefully thought out by my colleague from Douglas County, addresses a very important part of this bill that some argue should not be in the bill. If you look at the amendment, if you looked at the bill and start at line 10, it's section 9. Sale of all assets of bank, branches, or department. Now, I want everybody to understand exactly what it says. I think it's important that we do. It says any state bank may sell to any other bank. But now it adds or credit union. All or substantially all of the selling banks, assets, and business. Or all or substantially all the assets and business of any department or branch of the selling bank. Now, there is a concern in rural Colorado with respect to our small rural banks. They are concerned that the credit unions will now begin to move into the independent banking space in 
purchasing, acquiring and purchasing banks across rural Colorado. Now you have to understand that credit unions have different rules and regulations on what they can lend. The money that they can lend and what kind of loans they can write. They're not the same. They're different. The rules are different. The regulatory scrutiny is much greater in banks than it is in credit unions. It's not the same. And the loans that you can write from banks is different than credit unions by regulation. For example, if I wanted to go to a credit union, let's hypothetically say that we pass this bill without this amendment. And my local independent bank in my hometown gets bought out by a credit union. And I want to go in and buy a stock trailer because I have to haul my cattle to the sale barn in a month or two. And the old stock trailer's broken down, the axles have come off of it, and it can't get to town. With 20, 30,000 pounds of beef on the hoof rolling to the auction. If I go to the bank, I can write a loan and buy, based on a loan for equipment, equipment loan perhaps, I can buy this stock trailer, finance it, and be on my way. A credit union may have very different restrictions based on their rules and not allow me to do that. If we continue on with the agreement of purchase and sale that's authorized and approved by the banking board and by the majority of the stockholders, this also adds the purchase of banks or the majority of board directors of the purchasing credit union. So now credit union gets to be, and those board of directors that run these financial institutions now get put on the same uh, playing field. But my colleagues before me have explained that there is a difference between banks and credit unions, a distinct difference. Yes, they both have, like a vehicle, yes, they both have four wheels and have doors to get in. But what they can do is very different. One might be a jacked up 4x4 truck, the other one might be a high performance sports car. They're different. <clears throat> if we move a little farther down this amendment, which I think is, is striking this language, I think it's important that after such approval is given by the stockholders or directors, a note of such sale shall be published once a week for three successive weeks in a newspaper. So people know that this purchase has been done. That's standard procedure, but one of the things people won't understand is now that bank that's gone, and I will tell you something that's very troubling in rural Colorado, and I speak from the heart when I say this, ladies and gentlemen. When you lose something out in my neck of the woods, if it's a farm, if it's a grocery store, if it's a restaurant, if it's a bank, about 8.9 times out of 10, it never comes back. It's gone forever, primarily for economic reasons because of the economic depravity oftentimes in rural Colorado that we face, <clears throat> particularly in very tough economic times that directly correlate to the agricultural commodity prices and commodity cycles. So I think before we discard this amendment and say, no, we're not wanting to do this, we need to understand that my colleague from Douglas County, arguably one of the most astute in the financial arena, having served many years in finance and county financial instruments, working in the area that she works in, she brings this amendment, and it's a very well thought out and in clear, important amendment. Now this does protect depositors, um, and depositors can make full demand after such sale. But they may not want to change from a bank to a credit union, but they won't have that choice. People have said, is this the right place for the, the regulators to come in and make these claims? as regulators look from what I call a 50,000 foot view on the financial landscape from DORA. 
And I would argue that the way they look at it is very different than the way rural legislators would look at it and rural banks would look at it. I think my colleague from Montrose in the southwest part of this state who has an experience in banking, has been a banker, a financier of a bank, probably has the greatest level of understanding of anybody and at least near the greatest level of understanding of anybody in this chamber. So I think we should listen. We should listen. And the other thing is this, this, this particular, you know, we can pass this amendment, we can pass the bill, and then we can always come back and circle back and have this debate and discussion. Is this the right time to do this now? If, for example, Dora looks in their crystal ball and says, we're going to have a bunch of bank failures because the economy is going to go to trash real soon because of all the economic pressures on our economy and perhaps bad policy decisions we have made in this nation or even in the state that have caused inflation or hyperinflation, that are devaluing the value of the dollar, that are causing economic depravity and commodity cycles, that are going to affect the number two industry in the state, which is agriculture. And now these banks are going to be at risk, so we have to create conditions that allow for uh, the purchase of these institutions to try to keep the crash from being a bigger crash when banks fail. Then I'm getting very nervous up here. I am. If that's the crystal ball they're looking at, we have a much bigger problem in Colorado and this nation. I hope my fears are unfounded, but if we're trying to prepare for a future where we have banks that close, then ladies and gentlemen, harken back to the night, late 1920s and the 30s. They were called where I'm from the dirty 30s and it was called in your history books, if we even study history, the Great Depression. And you see, Colorado legislators, you need to understand something. For years before we really felt the acute crush of complete economic failure, the government and the banking institutions said, no, we're okay. Everybody's okay. Just hang on. This little whirlwind will pass. But as we know historically, it did not. And it crushed this nation. And if you want to know who has hurt the worst, come out to my community in northeastern Colorado. You see on Buffalo Springs Ranch, there are eight homesteads. I can stand on every one of them. Those homesteads are homesteads where there was a family, a father, a mother, children. There was a house. There were chickens. There was a milk cow. There was an old plow so they could turn the dirt and plant crops. Representative Holtorf, let's get back to the amendment, please. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. That. As we look at this amendment, we've got to understand that with this amendment, then we allow the banks to have the protection so they cannot be raided or run on by credit unions. And we can keep those independent banks in place. We need to prop up our banking. A credit union is not a bank. In fact, during those times in the 20s and 30s, I don't even know if they had the credit union system in rural Colorado. We had those rural independent banks that were out in many, many small rural farm towns. And the members of the board were actually members of the community. And everybody invested in their hometown bank and deposited in their hometown bank. So I have very clear reservations, Madam Chair, about the sunset and the recommendations and why we are doing this now. Once again, I hearken back to my history lesson about the Great Depression. Are we trying to prepare for something in the future that maybe they're concerned about as regulators? I merely speculate, Madam Chair, and members of this chamber. Oftentimes speculations are founded, oftentimes they're unfounded. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know I could talk for another hour about this theme, and, and that will happen later in this session, I fear, or two, or three, or four. 
But today I'm not. I'm not going to do that. But I do want you to know that I think this is a good amendment for right now. Now, I have spoken to my colleagues, two uh, legislators that I greatly respect, particularly my friend from Boulder. She has expressed to me concerns that come from the banking sector. And those concerns are not unfounded. I hope I can encourage her to come up and talk about them, although I know she doesn't have to, just to further explain that position. Because I think we need to hear those comments in robust and thorough debate. So thank you for your time. I do want to support this amendment, and I do want to support the bill. And I am very concerned about the future of this country. So let's be very careful as we do the things we do towards the last 30 days of session. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I, like many of you folks and my colleagues, have a lot of people weighing in on this particular subject. Credit unions, banks, and people that represent them. And I have to tell you that I have been a bit on the fence on this particular subject because I wanted time to think my way through it and to listen to all sides of the discussion. Therefore, the amendment makes a great deal of sense to me because this is a sunset bill. And while I respect the comments that, that it was debated at length, it's a major policy change. And to me, as a major policy change, it's deserving of this amendment and it's deserving of a bill all to its own. I also want to make a comment that one of my colleagues made up here on this amendment having to do with CEOs of banks. I'm not sure how that has anything to do with the amendment, but given the fact that it was opened up, I'd like to make a statement on that. We as CEOs are also in the world of supply and demand like every single job within our society. And there is absolutely no cr reason to criticize the fact that we are at times paid more than other people because it has to do with supply and demand and there's only so many people in an industry that can lead companies. And I would appreciate it from colleagues if they would stop criticizing CEOs as greedy. We work our butts off. And we are sub subject to supply and demand just as any other role within a business. And it has absolutely nothing to do with this amendment whatsoever. Thank you. Representative Bradley. Thank you. I wasn't going to come and speak about this bill, but as I look over the bill and I look over Section 9 and I listen to the good representative from Douglas County seeking to make this bill better, I figured I needed to. You know, I've been involved in a couple of sunset bills, and they're pretty easy. They, they go over without too much controversy. And the fact that we're all up here talking about this makes me very concerned that there is major policy being kind of snuck into a sunset bill. And I think that the sponsors maybe need to go back to the drawing board and pull a, a bill of its own. You know, there's a lot in Section 9. It's obvious this is something credit unions would like because there's no evidence that banks are having any trouble selling to other banks. I mean, where is the evidence that this is happening? And I bring you to the case where a sell to a $3.4 billion credit union, Elevations, was denied a few years ago. And the selling bank actually had four to five bank suitors and ended up selling to a $328 million Colorado State Chartered Community Bank. So I've yet to hear this, this big problem that banks aren't able to sell to other banks and that credit unions need to 
swoop in like Superman to save the day. The bottom line is that banks haven't expressed a need for more sales partner choices. And in fact, they actually oppose it. So again, where was the stakeholdering? Because my inbox is blowing up where the banks are feeling threatened. We're seeking a solution where there's no problem in the first place. And I've yet to hear that the credit unions are here to save the day. But I can't understand why credit unions support this major policy change, but because it is such a policy change, why is it being wedged into a sunset bill? It's ridiculous. This is not the way we do business. This is not the way we should do business in this chamber. What makes Section 9 so critically intertwined with the bill that it can't be removed and run as a standalone bill? You need to go back to the drawing board. The only truly critical provision of the bill, the one to continue the division of banking and deletion of Section 9, will not disrupt the current marketplace whatsoever versus what would happen to consumers and small businesses and agricultural lending if it's included. The great rep Catlin spoke about this. This is why we need this amendment. This amendment helps this bill. They argue, the bill sponsors, that there is no threat of credit union purchases altering the competitive market, of, competitive market because the number of credit unions buying banks is trivial when compared to the number of bank-to-bank -bank transactions. If true, then Bradley, banks actually... Yes. I just want to make sure that you're talking about the amendment. Absolutely. So we want to strip... Section 9, because Section 9 is saying that credit unions need to purchase, but banks are saying that they don't need to. So the important part of this amendment is taking that out of there because there's no problem with the credit union or the banks being able to sell. If true, then banks actually don't need choices at all because there is no shortage of bank buyers out there. And if bank to credit union purchases are expected to be few and far between, why is there consideration of holding up a sunset bill with truly critical components to it? because of a non-critical provision to allow a few credit unions to purchase banks. That's entirely what Section 9 is about. Section 9 is trying to seek a solution when there's no problem. Banks aren't having a hard time selling to other banks. They're swooping in credit unions because they're saying banks can't or having a problem selling. So this is what the amendment does. The amendment strips out that part of the bill. They say we need to protect against mega out-of-state banks consuming Colorado's community banks and closing branches. Mega banks do not consume community banks, but credit unions do. Credit unions are gonna swoop in and consume community banks. They do not need, banks do not need to buy small community banks to grow because they can grow more organically in a month than they can by paying a premium to acquire a small bank without the time and expense of a regulatory approval process system integrations, et cetera. And banks are not closing branches. That is why they're important. In the last two years, the Colorado Division of Banking has approved 46 new bank locations and bank loan production offices to serve their localities, while only approved 26 bank closure applications, almost twice as many opening as closing. The problem with, with this is we're gonna get rid of banks and we're going to regulate them more while opening the door for credit unions. And that's not free market. And I'll just end with, credit unions are consuming banks. More than 27% of all bank deals announced in the first two and a half months of 2024 have been credit unions buying banks. Their tax exempt status gives them a significant competitive advantage over other buyers because they can offer higher purchase prices. And since banks have an obligation to their stockholders to accept the highest sell offer, there really isn't a choice but to accept a credit union over a bank offer. These deals absolutely alter and I would say even kill the free market competitive system. I'm just going to end with, I think this is a great amendment. I think that our caucus can get on board and in the spirit of being bipartisan, if we take out this part and allow banks to do what their job is and not kill them and allow credit unions to swoop in, then this would be a great bill and we can all get on board. So I ask for an I vote on this critical amendment. Thank you. Representative Kipp. Um, thank you, members, and I am here to speak in opposition to this amendment. I just want to remind you that this report came as part of, this is part of the Sunset Report. These are following the recommendations in the Sunset Report. 46, there's only 50 states, 46 of them already allow this practice. 
And I just want to make the point that people don't seem to really be aware of is that if you allow this to happen to the, the, the credit unions to purchase these banks, then what will happen is that those credit unions still have to follow all of the same credit union rules and regulation. That does not change. Everything is fine. I think everybody just needs to breathe and understand this is not going to turn the world upside down. So I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Representative Frizzell. So you can see why we've had a lot of conversation around this particular sunset. So I think it's important to understand, we talked about the sunset, it's nice, here it is, sunset review by Dora. 10 recommendations they brought, 10. One was to continue the division and board for nine years until 2033. Another one to, was to amend the board composition by repealing the requirement that two members represent state banks with less than $150 million in total assets and instead require two mem members to represent state banks in the 40th percentile based on total asset size. Here's another one. Extend the authority for the board and the commissioner to share information regarding state bank and trust company compliance with money laundering and other financial crime laws with the U.S. Secretary of Treasure, Treasury and agencies. Here's another one. Recommendation five, clarify that changes of any executive officer, director, or other person who is responsible for the management, control, or operations of a stank bank or trust company must be reported to the board within six days. How about modernize the board's authority to issue civil money penalties? Hmm. Clarify that a trust company may discontinue its trust business if it provides evidence of its release and discharge of all trust-related obligations prior to surrendering its trust charter. That's some of them, some of the 10 recommendations. And then there is authorize a credit un union to purchase the assets and liabilities of a state bank. Very different tone. Very different. This is complicated. It should not be part of a sunset bill. It, if anything, it should be a study or a standalone. This requires analysis beyond the scope of the sunset process. It has no business being in a sunset review. Here's the thing. You've heard a lot of conversation today around the differences between credit unions and banks. One of the fundamental differences is their regulatory structure. Another is how they are taxed. And oh, by the way, credit unions are not taxed. They are tax exempt. Banks are not. But one of the biggest issues with this is that credit union loans are very, their portfolios are very different than that of commercial banks. Commercial banks are important. They are critical to the financial health of the state of Colorado. They are. Because they are the ones who loan commercially, on commercial property, on, com on businesses. They loan on real estate. They have a small piece of the pie, about 17% of the loans that they make are for consumer lending. It's very different. Credit unions, 93% of their loan portfolio, 93, the vast majority, are real estate and consumer lending. 
For banks, 83% are commercial and real estate, not so much the commercial lending. Credit unions do not loan commercially very much. And this is important. We've talked about our agricultural community. We've talked about ag loans. This is really why these community banks are important in, our, in rural Colorado. Here's just a couple of pieces of information. In 2022, Colorado banks invested in Colorado through direct small business loans and agricultural loans benefiting low and moderate income neighborhoods. Small farm origination and purchase loans statewide in 2022 was over 3,600 loans for $226 million. Those aren't credit unions making those loans, folks. The other thing that's really important to talk about as far as differences if you're weighing is the Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed in 19, 1977. Credit unions do not have to be part of or participate in the Community Reinvestment Act. Banks, our commercial banks, spend huge amounts of money every year to adhere to the Community Reinvestment Act. Credit unions do not. And in fact, in committee, when asked, when we asked the credit unions, would you be willing to join your banking brothers and sisters in participating in the Community Reinvestment Act, they looked at me blankly. Further, coming to the floor in the next several weeks, I suspect, is the Credit Union Sunset Report. The credit unions had every opportunity to weigh in on their sunset review and include themselves in the Community Reinvestment Act. And they chose not to. They could have, they could have thrown this very complicated subject into their own sunset review, and they chose not to. I know that there's an argument that it's time to allow these transactions. But at the same time, and this is important, members, at the same time, credit unions oppose having to comply with the regulations that banks have to on a daily basis. When a bank applies for approval of a bank-to-bank -bank transaction, major components of this approval analysis are scrutinized according to the bank's history of compliance and their public rating. Including their performance with the Community Reinvestment Act. Members, this is an important conversation that we're having here today. It's important. It's important to our banks and it's important to our credit unions. I do not think that this is a topic for a sunset review. I ask for an I vote on this amendment so that we can have this conversation in a standalone bill. I ask for your I vote. Representative Amable. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we've had an excellent, vigorous debate. And I will just close by saying a lot of work went into the Sunset Report, a lot of stakeholding, a lot of uh, data collection, and a lot of analysis. And this is where they came down. This is what they thought would be good for our state. Credit unions are not a threat to banks. Credit unions are member-owned. That's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. And um, I ask for a no vote on this amendment. 
Is there any further discussion on Amendment L002? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L002. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. All right, Amendment L002 fails. To the bill, Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that was fun. Um, the, the bummer is, is that there's so much good stuff in this, um, in this sunset. And, and oftentimes it's one thing that, that sets us apart and allows us not to be in support of it. Um, I just want to clarify a couple other things. We've, we've, we've settled that question that, that uh, Section 9 is going to stay in this. But, you know, to the comments about uh, nobody is forced to buy uh, a, 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 a credit union does not create a scenario that you're forced to sell to a credit union if you're a bank trying to sell. I'm not sure I said that right. But it does, actually, because if you are doing your job as a fiduciary and looking out for the, the best interest of that board and those shareholders, and you have a higher offer that is brought to you from a credit union, you are in breach of your fiduciary duties if you don't accept that higher offer. That, therefore, puts you in a position where if you have a small community bank and you get a higher offer and you turn that down, you're wrong. This makes that law. Let me talk about a couple other things, too. Whenever you see a vigorous debate down here, that means there's something going on in the background. What's going on in the background is somebody's being lobbied. So why would, why would the credit unions want to lobby in favor of this? Well, I would say it's because it gives them a strategic advantage in one of those sale uh, situations. Um, why are the banks fighting it? Because they know that. So that's what's really going on here. Where we, we, are putting, we are putting banks in a position where they will have to take that higher offer from a credit union. And also, um, you know, there's a strategic advantage in that. So it pains me to not be in support of this, but I can't with this particular uh, Section 9 staying in there. Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I urge a yes vote on this bill. Whether we agree or disagree on one recommendation in the sunset, we should still continue to regulate state chartered banks in Colorado. This is important. Please vote yes. Let's continue to regulate banks. Members, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1351. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. House Bill 1351 is adopted. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title of House Bill 1294. House Bill 1294 by Representatives Basenecker and Velasco, also Senator Cutter, concerning mobile homes that are located in a mobile home park and in connection therewith, specifying legal rights and responsibilities relating to the sale, lease, and purchase of such homes. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I move House Bill 1294 and the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Report and the Appropriations Committee Report. To the Appropriations Committee Report. We have an amendment for the Appropriations Committee Report, and then I'm certainly happy to speak about that. Um, but I move L11 to the Appropriations Committee Report and ask that it be properly displayed. L11 has been moved. And is properly displayed. P please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this amendment does not change the appropriation. However, we needed to make a technical fix to the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee report. And the easiest way to do that was through the, the Appropriations Committee report. So it is really just a technical fix to some numbering in the bill that you see before you now, and we'd ask for a yes vote. Members, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L011. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> okay. All those opposed say no. No. 
All right, the ayes have it, and Amendment L-011 is adopted. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Appropriations Committee, there was an appropriation made um, out of cash funds from one department to the other to be able to um, account for the additional parks that are now subject to the Mobile Home Park Act, and we'd ask for a yes vote. All right, is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? All right, the committee report passes. Representative Basenecker, to the Transportation Committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the uh, Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee, we made a number of significant amendments to the bill as a result of our, appreciate my colleague, um, as a number of our ongoing stakeholder work um, with the organization that represents mobile home park owners. Those conversations were very productive, and I would be remiss if I did not say thank you for their engagement. Um, in fact, as a result of these amendments, um, that organization moved to neutral on the bill. We are continuing conversations about some other pieces, but it's been very productive, um, and we would just ask for a yes vote based on those amendments and that ongoing good work. Is there any further discussion on the Transportation Committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the, path, or the adoption of the Transportation Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The committee report is passed. To the bill. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move L10 to House Bill 1294. And ask that it be properly displayed. Thank you very much. All right, the amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this, uh, this amendment um, is in response to a concern brought by our realtor friends. Um, it moves them from amend to neutral on the bill. It simply strikes some um, language about rent equity um, that we had overlooked in the bill, but we are in mutual agreement that this is not the bill and this is not the year for that language. So we'd ask for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, Representative Kip. Um, all those opposed say no. <laughs> all right, the um, amendment passes. Representative Velasco. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, this is just a really good bill that would make sure that our community members who live in mobile home parks are able to have access to dignified housing. So we are yes vote. All right, is there any further discussion on House Bill 1294? Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will keep my remarks brief. Um, some of the pieces that we continue to respond to in this space and I think are really important and why I'm so proud of the really bipartisan work that we've been able to do on this bill. Um, we've been able to respond to concerns regarding rent to own and lease to own agreements. You'll see that language in this bill. Language access remains a huge concern for folks across housing spaces. And I think we were able to strike a good compromise to make sure that folks aren't evicted unnecessarily simply because they don't understand the documents and the notices in front of them. And that we wanna make sure that those are accessible for all residents in the state of Colorado. Um, there's also some very important considerations regarding to water, making sure that folks don't have to rely on bottled water for hygiene or cooking, and that there's adequate sources for those things. And then I, th I think last but not least, we've been able to also work on how some of these complaints are adjudicated and what the proper point is for the adjudication if there's, say, an eviction pending in a park. And so we would ask for your support on this bill. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1294? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1294 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. All right, the ayes have it, and House Bill 1294 as amended is passed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1344. House Bill 1344 by Representatives Leader and Ricks, also Senator Pelton B, concerning the continuation of the State Plumbing Board and in connection therewith implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Representative Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
Members, I move House Bill 241344, the committee reports uh, from appropriations and business labor. I believe that you, we just have a business uh, report, so I'm going to let you proceed with that. Okay. The business report, we added four amendments uh, due to stakeholdering. Um, do you want me to explain the amendment now? Just well, I move L001, L002, L003, and L005. Thank you, Representative Leader. We're going to take those individually. Oh, wait, wait. Wait a second. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. No, okay. this is already done. They were moved in committee. Okay, so they were already adopted. Yeah, we're talking adopted about the committee, committee report. Yeah. Perfect. Please proceed. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what this bill does um, is the bill implements the recommendations of DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, in the 2023 Sunset Review of the State Plumbing Board. Uh, the board will continue for another eight years uh, due to an amendment because the amendment, the original one was till 2030, till 2037, and we thought that was too long. So we moved it from 13 years to eight years. That was just one of the amendments. And then the bill clarifies that the licensed category of plumbers and plumbing apprenticeships and registered plumbing contractors can work on water conditioning systems. Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in committee, we adopted four different amendments. Um, the, first, the first one was to move the sunset expiration date and restore the Senate confirmation of the board. Uh, we also had requirements to display contractor registration ID and master plumbing, plumber license numbers. Uh, we adopted uh, clarifying license requirements for backflow devices. And in addition to that, we're going to do a three-year renewal cycle for plumbing licenses. We ask for your I vote. Is there any further discussion on the business committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the business committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The business committee report is passed. To the Th bill. Thank you. Representative Leader. Yes, and pretty much as I reiterated earlier, um, it just continues the Plumbing Sunset Board for eight years. Uh, the board will be authorized to discipline plumbers who aid a person's violating the uh, Plumbing Practices Act or other statutes that apply to plumbers. And it's a good bill. Vote yes. Representative Ricks. Vote yes. Thank you. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is an example of a good sunset. This is the way this should go. Thank you for your hard work on that. Um, there's no controversy in it. Uh, this is the way sunset should go. I'm just kind of using this as an example. Uh, please vote yes. Good bill. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1344? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1344. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 1344 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1377. House Bill 1377 by Representatives Marvin and Young concerning court-appointed special advocates who work with youth in the Foster Youth in Transition Program. Representative Marvin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Oh, it's an honor to serve with you as well. I would like to move House Bill 24, 1377. To the bill. Thank you. So um, a little bit about this bill. So court-appointed special advocates uh, called CASAs are, divine, are defined in statute and required by law to provide support and services for children who have experienced abuse, neglect, domestic violence, uh, or are chronically absent from school. CASAs are volunteers appointed by judges to advocate for the children's best interests and work alongside that child's legal and professional team. Each volunteer stays with the child until the case is closed and the child is in a safe and permanent home. 
Additionally, in 2021, we created the Foster Youth in Transition Program, which allows eligible foster youth to voluntarily continue to receive certain child welfare services until the last day of the month in which their 21st birthday occurs or such greater age of foster care eligibility as required by federal law. But the thing is that our kids and youth needing help don't, doesn't necessarily end when someone turns 18. So House Bill 1377 would allow CASA to continue to be attached or reattached to the youth after they turn 18. Early adult years can be a tumultuous time, particularly as a young adult transitions from foster care, kinship placement, residential treatment facilities, or other living arrangements. This bill doesn't require a CASA to be attached past the age of 18, but it does allow for a young adult to ask and receive support and services that they need. This bill ensures that CASAs have the legal authority to provide the continuum of care for young adults who are emancipating out of foster care and allows CASA volunteers who know these children well and may be one of the most constant individuals in their lives to continue to advocate alongside them into young adulthood. Representative Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, briefly, I've been a CASA for over a decade, and this bill also clarifies that uh, a youth like the last um, youth I worked with who still had a dependency and neglect case past the age of 18 uh, con would be able to continue working with a CASA. She obviously, she did not end up in a permanent placement and um, that relationship continued to help her work through uh, what was happening after her emancipation around housing, work, and supports for her to live successfully. I urge and I vote. Is there any further discussion? I, I'm sorry, Representative Marvin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we do have one um, amendment, and so I move Amendment L001 and ask for it to be displayed. All right, L001 has been properly moved. So, um, real oh, quick just, about just a moment, just a moment. We need to make sure it's displayed, okay? All right, the amendment is properly before us. Please proceed, Representative Marvin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this amendment, it came from working with our stakeholders. Um, really what it is is that given the role of CASA to represent the child's best use interests in DN DNN cases as, that youth person, as the young person shifts to or reapproaches the youth in transition program, it clarifies um, that they can continue working with their CASA. Representative Young. It, it, it really, um, what this amendment does is clarifies that a youth past 18 who is involved in the youth in transition program uh, will give consent to working with their uh, CASA. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Yeah. Representative Holtorf. That's a good one. I'm on your side. Good. You ready? Stay close. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is a great amendment. And I'm going to tell everybody in the chamber why. Not just the fact that these two legislators, who are very, very tied to CASA and foster care, but because when you're 18, you're an adult. When you're 18, you can make decisions and should make decisions on your own. You see, you're not a child anymore. And if you think you want to act as an adult and make a decision that says, I do not want the CASA volunteer to have access to these things because now I want to make my own decisions, you have that opportunity with this amendment. And I respect that. Because when I turned 18, I remember I went and signed that draft card, Selective Service Registration Form, and I was 18, and I knew everything, and I was going to go conquer the world. I'm not being facetious. I was an adult. And we should respect the fact when people are 18 years old, they can make decisions for themselves. If they want to go to the recruiter and join the military, they don't have to ask their parents anymore. If they want to move to a different state and get a job and go conquer the world, they can do that. 
if they're a foster youth and they're trying to transition using the resources that we have so they can do with their life and move to adulthood and be independent adults and they feel that the cost of volunteer maybe not have their best interests at heart, they can do that. So I'm 100% in support of this amendment, ladies, and I thank you for respecting and recognizing the role of adulthood at the age of 18. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L001. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Okay, the amendment is passed. To the bill. Representative Marvin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to wrap up, supporting this bill is supporting the future of Colorado by providing young adults with services and support that they need as they emerge from difficult situations to become productive and healthy adults in our community. The need for support doesn't always end the day that someone turns 18, and this bill will ensure a transition time for young adults that need it most, and I urge a yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Young. Just briefly. Um, this allows CASAs who are well-trained and committed to their work to be able to continue a relationship that they have fosters sometimes over um, close to a decade. All right, Representative Epps. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to speak briefly to this bill, uh, both because of my professional and personal experience. I was a CASA back in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I also am the now adult version of someone who was once in kinship placement. Far too often, the ways in which we invest state resources ostensibly aim to help this very vulnerable population is in ways that are counterproductive, in family policing systems, in invasive things, in criminal legal interventions. This bill furthers our opportunity to continue to invest in the right sort of programs, ones that are meeting right at the, the right intersection of state resources and community members. Um, the version of the CASA who was supportive of me years ago is still a person in my life and that relationship matters a lot. Uh, outcomes are really, it's, it's, tough to, it's tough to support folks who are in foster placement in ways that give us really good opportunities to have great outcomes. And the CASA system is one of the things that does this. And I really, really love the recognition that, you know, the night of your 18th birthday, uh, many things may happen in terms of rights conveyed, but you don't magically become a person who doesn't need the support and love and care that you had the day before. So I'm really grateful for this and join the sponsors in asking for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1377? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1377 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, and House Bill 1377 as amended passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1232. House Bill 1232 by Representative Snyder, also Senator, Janal, Senator Gardner, concerning the enactment of the Uniform Special Deposits Act. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And may I say it's an honor to serve with you? Well, sir, it's an honor to serve with you, too. Thank you. And with that, I move House Bill 1232. To the bill. So... Uh, so this is a Uniform Law Commission bill, and I think I'll read the little prep. The Uniform Law Commission is a nonprofit formed in 1892 to create nonpartisan state legislation. Over 350 volunteer commissioners, lawyers, judges, law professors, legislative staff, and others work together to draft laws ranging from the Uniform Commercial Code, our most famous product, Acts on property, trusts, and estates, family law, criminal law, and other areas of law where uniformity of state law is desirable. So today we're talking about the Uniform Special Deposits Act. And you may ask yourself, as I did when I first heard about this bill over the summer, what exactly is a special deposit? A special deposit is a deposit of money at a bank where the person entitled to the money is only determined after a contingency occurs. 
So the easiest way to think about it is probably just a landlord-tenant situation. So somebody rents a, a unit, they put down a security deposit. Uh, what should happen to that security deposit? I don't think we want the landlords taking the money and commingling it with other funds. It really doesn't belong to the landlord. It doesn't belong to the tenant anymore. It's really, we don't know who it belongs to. There's no property interest in that money until a contingency occurs. So in this, that case, it would be upon vacating the premises, usually the landlord has an opportunity to inspect, and if there's damage, they can deduct out. That's to be negotiated. But while that tenant's in there, that money is not owned by anybody. It's also very applicable to class action lawsuits and others. But this is very, uh, it's, a very it's an opt-in statute, so nobody, no bank is required to offer special deposits. Um, it's really drafted very specifically. So we don't try to duplicate the language from other laws around deposits. It really just looks to clarify some of the ambiguities and some of the uncertainties that existed with special deposits. So there's a lot of good, I think, protections in here. And once that money is put into a special deposit, with a few minor exceptions, it's pretty much exempt from bankruptcy law, exempt from credit or judgments, because that money is there for a special purpose. We just don't know who it's ultimately going to go to. Uh, there's some good provisions in here that make sure that the special deposit is not being used for fraud or money laundering and things like that. So it really is a, a good, tight bill. Hopefully it will help our uh, commercial banking institutions to have more certainty and allow for special deposits, which are a great vehicle for doing many types of different transactions. And with that, I would ask for a yes vote. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. An honor to serve with you as well. Members, I uh, just wanted to come down and talk about this bill. I heard it in committee, and I really like this bill. It's a, it's a really good bill. I had never heard of a special uh, deposit until I pulled out the bill folder and read it. One thing that I uh, just want to say is one thing we talked about in committee was what happens if there's a case where it's so far in the future that you don't know when the contingency event is going to happen that's going to trigger knowing who the beneficiary is because I was quite concerned about the rule against perpetuities somehow being circumvented uh, within this bill and learned that uh, there's actually only a five-year lifespan on special deposits, which actually makes this very much ripe for the landlord-tenant security deposit, which is, is incredibly important because, after all, that doesn't belong to neither the landlord nor the tenant until certain things happen, such as the end of the lease and maybe there's a 30-day release and it's contingent upon certain things being known. I did have a question um, for the bill sponsor, though. Okay. So my question uh, in regards to the actual knowledge, so on page three of the bill, uh, it talks about knowledge of a fact, and so the fact would be the event that has to occur with respect to the beneficiary. How does the bank who's holding the special deposit know that the actual event has occurred which triggers the release of the special deposit? You're asking me what triggers that? Uh, uh, how, how the bank actually has the knowledge that the contingency event has actually occurred. Yeah. So Representative so no Snyder. Can occur. So it's set up, it, the, the act is set up in a very flexible way. Uh, so that would be really a case-by-case -case basis. But there will be release language in that de deposit agreement that would tell them upon this contingency uh, and certification or how whatever they want to put in there, then the bank can release the money. Hmm. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that, Representative Snyder. Now, this is a great bill, and I just appreciate the clarification. Glad we're going to be the, uh, well, we were set to be the first state, but I guess we'll be the second state. <laughs> yeah, Washington beat us out by a couple weeks. All right, is there any further discussion? All right, seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1232. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 1232 is passed. 
Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. All right. Uh, okay, hold, hold tight, hold tight. Everybody paying attention, you're going to get a second shot at this. You have heard the motion, seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report. The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report is under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1232, 1294 is amended, 1344, 1351, and 1377 is amended. Passed on second reading order and gross to place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Wilford. Members, you have heard the motion. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Frizzell Amendment to, the, to House Bill 1351 to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Frizzell moved to amend the part of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in adopting the following Frizzell Amendment, L2 to House Bill 1351. To show that sediment passed, that House Bill 1351 is amended passed. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the Frizzell Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. And ask that it be properly displayed. Thank you very much. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you. Members, we have had lively dialogue this morning about House Bill 1351, the banking sunset. And there is nothing wrong with 90% of this banking sunset. Nine of the 10 recommendations 
are fine and we should adopt them. One of them deserves greater scrutiny, deserves greater participation, greater analysis, and I ask that you vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. Representative, Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have had a rigorous debate on this amendment. It's been through a thorough public process. 46 other states allow these trans transactions to go through. Please vote no on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of the Frizzell Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? No. Representative Ortiz votes no. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Bacon Garcia, Story Young. Please close the machine. With 23 aye, 37 no, and five excuse, the amendment is lost. The motion before us is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Uh, excuse me, Madam Speaker, is the motion to the committee? The motion is to adopt the report of the Committee of the Whole. Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Holtorf. Please close the machine. With 43 ayes, 17 no, and five excuse, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the following bills be made special orders on Thursday, April 11, 2024. Madam, Madam Majority Leader, my apologies. I'm gonna ask you to withdraw your motion. We first need to take care of some business. I withdraw my motion. Thank you. Mr. Schiebel, please read reports of committees of reference. Committee on Business Affairs and Labor, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following House Bills 1356 amended and 1378 as amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Favor recommendation. Committee on Education, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following House Bill 1247 be amended as followed and as amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Health and Human Services, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following House Bill 1382 be amended as followed and as amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations. Senate Bill 8 be amended as followed and as amended be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. Committee on Judiciary, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following House Bills 1380 as amended and 1433 be referred to the Committee of the Whole, House Bill 1432, and Senate Bill 3 as amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Transportation, Housing, and Local Government, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following House Bills 1239 and 1242 be postponed indefinitely, House Bill 1383 be referred to the Committee of the Whole, and Senate Bill 100 be amended as followed and also amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Whew. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that the following bills be made special orders on Thursday, April 11, 2024, at 11.32 a.m. House Bill 1378, House Bill 1383, and Senate Bill 137. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the Majority Leader, Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to uh, register my objection. Okay, um, since we do have an objection, we will proceed to a vote. Members, Representative Soper. Members, the question before us is whether to proceed to our special orders calendar on Thursday, April 10th at 1132 a.m. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no.
Snyder and Froelich. Please close the machine. With 43 ayes, 17 no, and five excused, the motion is adopted. Representative Parenti. Members, you have heard the motion. Representative Parenti will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon the motion of the majority leader and the cult is relaxed. We good? All right. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title to House Bill 24-1378? House Bill 1378 by Representatives Lynn Seddon Valdez, also Senator Sullivan and Gardner, concerning consumer protection in event ticket sales. Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, the bill and the committee report. So moved. To the committee report. Uh, Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the committee, we did a few things. Uh, we clarified that this bill does not apply to movie theaters. We made some technical language cleanups. Uh, we worked on an agreement with the small independent venues to clarify uh, some of the language around uh, revoking uh, tickets. And we cleaned up the charitable language uh, in, in the bill. Uh, we urge a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 24-1378? Representative Weinberg. Or are we still on the, we're on the committee report. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the approval of the committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those uh, opposed say no. And the committee report is passed to the bill. Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have been working on this bill all summer long um, with a variety of stakeholders to protect consumers when it comes to buying tickets for concerts uh, and sporting events. Uh, what this bill will do is require that all pricing is all in on the, the advertised price so you're not surprised when you're checking out uh, a ticket. It will guarantee that all consumers get refunds on shows that are canceled. It will also ban the use of deceptive websites that masquerade as uh, venues and official uh, sellers. And it will guarantee that all consumers have the right to resell their ticket um, as it is their, their own ticket and their own property. So it's a great bill. Uh, we have no opposition in committee. It passed almost unanimously. Uh, it will protect consumers and put some critical ground rules in place so that people can go enjoy the sporting events and concerts uh, that, that, that make Colorado so great. So we urge a yes vote. Uh, thank you for your time. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a great 
bill members. This is going to level the playing field so people, when they go on to buy a ticket, they know what they're going to pay up front. They know that if the event is canceled, they can get that uh, refund and that they don't have to worry uh, about fake websites, which are a big problem in tickets. This is important for all of us, and uh, urge and I vote. Representative Bradley. Thank you. None of my caucuses had time to look at this. This is getting added to the calendar at the very last minute. So in order for us to be prepared, I'd like to have the bill read at length. That is, that is a proper motion. The bill will be read at length. Second regular session 74th General Assembly State of Colorado introduced. LLS No. 24 to 536.02 Christopher McMichael X 4775 House Bill 24 to 1378. House Committees Senate Committees Business Affairs and Labor. A Bill for an Act. 101 Concerning Consumer Protection in Event Ticket Sales. Bill Summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. The bill amends consumer protection laws regarding ticket sales and resales for events. The bill requires operators and resellers to guarantee refunds to purchasers of tickets under certain circumstances. The bill prohibits an operator from denying an individual access to an event because the individual's ticket was bought through a reseller. The bill also expands the actions that constitute a deceptive trade practice during the sale or resale of tickets. A person engages in a deceptive trade practice when, in the course of the person's business. House Sponsorship Lindstedt and Valdez. Senate Sponsorship Sullivan and Gardner. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing law. Dashes through the words or numbers indicate deletions from existing law. Vocation, or occupation, the person. Displays trademarked, copyrighted, or substantially similar web designs, URLs, or other images and symbols with the intent to mislead a purchaser. Sells a ticket to an event without disclosing the total cost of the ticket, including the cost of any service charge or other fees that must be paid, or displays service charges and fees less prominently than the total price of the ticket, or increases the price of a ticket once the ticket has been selected for purchase, with the exception of adding delivery fees. 1. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado, 2. Section 1. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 6-1-718, Amend, 1, 3 Introductory Portion, 1, C, 2, 3, A, Introductory Portion, 3, A, 4, 4 and, 3, B, as follows, 5-6-1-718. Ticket Sales and Resales, Prohibitions, Unlawful Six Conditions, Definitions. 1. As used in this section and in Section 76-1-720, unless the context otherwise requires, 8, C, I, place of entertainment, or venue, means a public or nine private entertainment facility I in this state, such as a stadium, arena, 10 racetrack, museum, amusement park, or other place where performances, 11 concerts, exhibits, athletic games, or contests are held, for which an entry 12 fee is charged, to which the public is invited to observe, and for which 13 tickets are sold. 14. 2. Place of entertainment, or venue, does not include a ski 15 area. 16. 2. Resellers and operator or a reseller from which a 17. Purchaser bought a ticket shall guarantee a full refund of the ticket. 18. Price to a the purchaser if 19. A. The event for which the ticket was resold is cancelled. Dash 2. HB 24-1378. 1. B. The ticket does not or would not in fact grant the purchaser two admission to the event for which the ticket was resold except if three non-admission to the event is due to an ACT or omission by the four purchaser. 5. C. The ticket purchased from the reseller or operator is 6 counterfeit, or 7. D. The ticket purchased from the reseller or operator fails 8 to conform to its description as advertised or as represented to the 9 purchaser. By the reseller. 10. 3. A. It is void as against public policy to apply a term or 11 condition to the original sale of a ticket to the A purchaser to limit that 12 limits the terms or conditions of the resale of that ticket, including 13 but not limited to, a term or condition. 14. 4. That imposes a sanction on the purchaser if the sale of the 15 ticket is not through a reseller that is not approved by the operator. 16. B. Nothing in this section shall be deemed to prohibit prohibits 17 an operator from prohibiting the resale of. 18. I. A contractual right in a season ticket package agreement that. 19. Gives the original purchaser a priority or other preference to enter into a 20 subsequent season ticket package agreement with the operator, or 21. 2. A ticket to a place of entertainment if the ticket was 22 initially offered. 23. A. At no charge, and access to the ticket is not 24 contingent upon providing any form of monetary consideration. 25 or 26, b, by or on behalf of a charitable organization, as 27 defined in section 6-16-103-1, for a charitable event for a. Dash 3, HB 24-1378.
One benevolent, educational, philanthropic, humane, scientific, two patriotic, social welfare, social advocacy, public health, three environmental, civic, or other eleemosynary purpose, for and four objective of law enforcement officers, firefighters, or other five individuals who protect the public safety, or for veterans. Six where all proceeds from the ticket sale are provided to the seven charitable organization. 8. Section 2. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 6-1-720, Amend, 1, 9 Introductory Portion, 1, A, and, 2, and add, 1, C, 1, D, 1, E, 1, F, 10, 1, G, 1, H, 1, I, and, 2.5, as follows, 11 6-1-720. Ticket Sales, Deceptive Trade Practice, Definitions. 12. 1. A person engages in a deceptive trade practice when, in the course of 13 the person's business, vocation, or occupation, such the person, 14, uses or causes to be used a software application that runs 15 automated tasks over the internet to access a computer, computer. 16. Network, or computer system, or any part thereof, for the purpose of. 17. Purchasing tickets in excess of authorized limits for an online event ticket 18. Sale with the intent to resell such tickets, or 19. C. Uses or causes to be used an internet domain name or 20 subdomain name in an operator's or reseller's URL if the 21 internet domain name or subdomain name used contains any of 22 the following without prior written authorization. 23. I. The name of the place of entertainment. 24. 2. The name of the event, including the name of the 25 individual or entity scheduled to perform or appear at the 26 event, or 27. 3. A name substantially similar to those described in. Dash 4, HB 24 1378. 1 subsections, 1, C, I, and, 1, C, 2, of this section, 2, D, uses or causes TO be used, without prior written 3 authorization, and internet website TO display a text, image, for website graphic, website design, or internet address that 5 individually or in combination is substantially similar to and 6 operators internet website in a manner that could reasonably 7 be expected TO mislead a potential purchaser, 8, E, sells a ticket to an event at a place of entertainment 9 without disclosing. The total ticket cost, inclusive of all 10 ancillary fees that must be paid in order to purchase the ticket, 11 the first time a price is displayed to the purchaser and any time 12 the price is displayed thereafter, 13, F, sells a ticket to an event at a place of entertainment 14 without disclosing in a clear and conspicuous manner the 15 portion of the ticket cost that represents a service charge for 16 the purchase or other fee or surcharge for the purchase. 17, G, makes a false or misleading disclosure to a purchaser. 18 of subtotals, fees, charges, or any other component of the total 19 price of a ticket, 20, H, present subtotals, fees, charges, or any other 21 component of the total price of the ticket more prominently or 22I in a font size that is larger than the font size used to present the 23 total price of the ticket, or 24I, increases the total price of a ticket after the first time 25A price is displayed to the purchaser, except that the person may 26th add fees for the delivery of non-electronic tickets based on 27 delivery to the purchaser's address or the delivery method. Dash 5, HB 24-1378. One selected by the purchaser if the person discloses the amount of two each delivery fee prior to accepting payment. 3, 2, as used in this section, unless the context otherwise requires. 4, A, in excess of authorized limits, with regard to an online five purchase of tickets, means exceeding a restriction on the number of six individual tickets that can be purchased by any a single person or seven circumventing any other terms and conditions of access to an online event eight ticket sale established by the event sponsor or promoter operator. 9. B. Internet domain name means a globally unique, 10 hierarchical reference to an internet host or service that is, 11. I. Assigned through a centralized internet naming 12 authority, and 13. 2. Composed of a series of character strings separated 14 by periods with the rightmost string specifying the top of the 15 hierarchy. 16. B. C. Online event ticket sale means an electronic system A. 17. Process utilized by the sponsor or promoter of a sporting or. 18. Entertainment event operator to sell make an original sale of tickets 19 to such the event to the public over the internet. 20, D, URL, means a uniform resource locator for a website 21 on the internet. 22, 2.5, definitions in section 6-1-718, 1, apply to terms as 23 they are used in this section. 24, section 3. Act subject to petition, effective date, 25 applicability. 1, this act takes effect at 12.01 a.m. on the day following 26 the expiration of the 90-day period after final adjournment of the 27 General Assembly, except that, if a referendum petition is filed pursuant. Dash 6, HB 24-1378. 1 to Section 1, 3, of Article V of the State Constitution against this Act or in 2 item, section, or part of this Act within such period, then the Act, item, 3 section, or part will not take effect unless approved by the people at the four general election to be held in November 2024 and, in such case, will take 5 effect on the date of the official declaration of the vote thereon by the 6th Governor. 7, 2, this Act applies to conduct occurring on or after the effective 8 date of this Act. Dash 7, HB 24-1378. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 24-1378? Seeing none, the motion before us is the passage of House Bill 24-1378. All those in favor say aye. aye. 
All those opposed say no. The bill passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 24-1383. House Bill 1383 by Representative Lindstedt, also Senator, Senator Michael Sinjanae, concerning declarations that form common interest communities under the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act. Mr. Uh, Representative Lindstedt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1383. To the bill. Representative Lindstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. House Bill 1383 is a really simple bill. All it does is guarantee that your name is on all of the declarations to your property. It got out of committee unanimously. Uh, it's a good piece of legislation to fix a loophole that some creative attorneys found uh, and, and guarantees that people who own property have their name on every declaration. I urge a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1383? Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, fellow colleagues, uh, this bill has been sprung on myself. It's just gained itself out of committee. Out of respect for our constituents and our state, and for me to give me a minute to actually digest and review the language of this bill, I would like to request that this be read at length. That is a proper motion. The bill will be read at length. Second regular session, 74th General Assembly State of Colorado introduced. LLS No. 24 to 394.01 Claire Hafner X6137 House Bill 24 to 1383. House Committees, Senate Committees, Transportation, Housing and Local Government. A Bill for an Act. 101 Concerning Declarations that Form Common Interest. 102 Communities under the Colorado Common Interest 103 Ownership Act. Bill Summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. Under the Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act, CCIOA, every common interest community must be formed by the execution and recording of a declaration. The CCIOA does not state who is required to execute the declaration. The bill clarifies that. A declaration that forms a common interest community. House Sponsorship Linstead. Senate Sponsorship Michelson Jennett. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing law. Dashes through the words or numbers indicate deletions from existing law. Must be executed by or with the express written authorization of the owner or owners of the real estate that is to be included in the common interest community, and any amendment to a declaration that adds real estate to a common interest community must be executed by or with the express written authorization of the owner or owners of the real estate to be added. 1. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado. 2. Section 1. Legislative Declaration. 1. The General Assembly 3 finds and declares that, 4. A. In FD Interests, LLC v. Fairways at Buffalo Run Homeowners 5 Association Incorporated, 2019 COA 148, 490p.3d 496. The Colorado Court of Six Appeals held that the recording of a declaration executed by an affiliate of 7 the owner of real property that was intended to be included in a common 8 interest community pursuant to Section 38-33.3-201, Colorado revised 9 statutes, but not executed by the owner of the property, was effective to 10 create the common interest community and to govern the future use and 11 development of the property. In that case, the Court of Appeals held that 12 the trial court had erred in reforming the recorded declaration to include 13 the owner's signature because the declaration had been validly executed 14 by the owner's affiliate and reformation was unnecessary. 15. B. With this act, the General Assembly intends to clarify, 4. 16 parties that currently have an interest in real property or that may acquire 17 an interest in real property, that, like other documents purporting to affect 18 title to or use of real property in the absence of specific statutory authority 19 allowing execution by another person, a declaration that creates a 20 common interest community, and any amendment to a declaration that 21 adds real property to an existing common interest community, must be 22 executed by or on behalf of the record owner of the real property to be. Dash 2, HB 24-1383. One included in the common interest community. The General Assembly too further intends to confirm that the equitable remedy of Reformation 3 should, in appropriate situations, in accordance with principles of equity, for and with due regard for all affected interests, be available to correct errors 5 relating to the execution or contents of documents affecting real property. 6 Section 2. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 38-33.3-201, Amend 7, 1, as follows, 838-33.3-201. Creation of Common Interest Communities. 9. 1. A. A common interest community may be created pursuant to this 10 article Article 33.3 only by recording a declaration executed in the same 11 manner as a deed and, in a cooperative, by conveying the real estate 12 subject to that declaration to the association. The declaration must be, 13. I. Executed by or with the express written authorization 14 of the owner or owners of the real estate that is TOB included. 
15 in the common interest community, American Samoa shown by the records of. 16 the county clerk and recorder's office of the county where the 17 real estate is located, 18, 2, recorded in every county in which any portion of the common 19 interest community is located, and must be 20, 3, indexed in the grantees index in the name of the common 21 interest community and in the name of the association, and 22, 4, indexed in the grantors index in the name of each person 23 executing the declaration. 24. B. No common interest community is created until the plat or 25 map for the common interest community is recorded. 26. Section 3. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 38-33.3-217, Amend 27, 3, as follows. Dash 3, HB 24-1383. 138-33.3-217. Amendment of Declaration. 3. Any amendment to to a declaration that adds real estate to a common interest 3 community must be executed by or with the express written for authorization of the owner or owners of the real estate to be 5 added, as shown by the records of the county clerk and 6 recorder's office of the county where the real estate is located. 7. Every amendment to the declaration must be recorded in every county in 8 which any portion of the common interest community is located and is 9 effective only upon recordation. An amendment must be indexed in the 10 grantees index in the name of the common interest community and the 11 association and in the grantors index in the name of each person 12 executing the amendment. 13. Section 4. Act subject to petition, effective date, 14 applicability. 1. This act takes effect at 12.01 a.m. on the day following 15 the expiration of the 90-day period after final adjournment of the 16 General Assembly, except that, if a referendum petition is filed pursuant 17 to Section 1, 3, of Article V of the State Constitution against this act or an 18 item, section, or part of this act within such period, then the act, item, 19 section, or part will not take effect unless approved by the people at the 20 general election to be held in November 2024 and, in such case, will take 21 effect on the date of the official declaration of the vote thereon by the 22 Governor. 23, 2, this act applies to declarations that are executed or amended 24 on or after the effective date of this act. Dash 4, HB 24-1383. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 24-1383? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 24-1383. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The bill is passed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 24-137. Senate Bill 137 by Senators Simpson and Gonzalez, also Representatives Martinez and Holtorf, concerning the planting of uncertified potatoes and in connection therewith, requiring that uncertified potato seed stock be tested and approved by the certifying authority of Colorado before planting. Yeah. Representative Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move Senate Bill 24-137. To the bill, Representative Martinez. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm here today bringing you up. Uh, you've heard about this on Twitter. You've heard about this uh, via podcasts. The most important bill of the session, the most interesting <laughs> bill title of the session, um, the planting of uncertified potato seeds. I'm up here with my best buddy to tell you about why this is such a critical issue for not only the San Luis Valley, but the state of Colorado. I would say because this, there are multiple districts that grow potatoes, so this is really a match made in heaven with Bill's sponsorship to making sure that we are advocating for the potatoes that have an impact here. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I stand before you fellow colleagues with my spud buddy, we are here to talk about taters and tater seed. <laughs> certified or uncertified, it's important to Colorado. Now, arguably, my colleague in his house district grows more potatoes than we grow in my house district. But we do share this union. Colleagues, this is a spectacular bill. And we need your support. Representative Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Make no mistake, while there are a lot of potato puns today, this bill is no small potatoes. <laughs> and we hope that you're not French fried from the, the work of today, because this bill is sweeter than potato pie when we're talking. Representative Holtorf. And a reminder that there are no props allowed at the well, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to submit my request 
from my colleague to have the spectacular Colorado potato displayed as a prop, but I understand that the leadership has said nay, so the spuds must go away. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the truth, this bill is sweeter than potato pie, and if you don't vote yes, Martinez and I are going to cry. We urge an I vote. <laughs> Representatives McLaughlin and Lukens and Marvin, apparently. <laughs> Excuse me, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I had to ask the sponsors, what are your thoughts on this? And they told us it's time for a fresh start. But I was only a spectator to that conversation. <laughs> Representative Marvin. Thank you. I just wanted to come up today in support of this bill. As a potato enthusiast, I fully support it. In Colorado, this, is a, this bill is a mash made in heaven for our potato industry. Thank you to the sponsors for your commitment to quality control to ensure that spuds get a certified stamp of approval before they can sprout into action. Representative Lukens. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you don't like this bill, we are going to shake it off because Tater's going to tate. <laughs> we hope you vote yes on this bill, but it's the tot that counts. Ag Committee had a blast with this bill, and time fries when you're having fun. And these potato puns are sure to sprout a smile. Representative Hartsook. Thank you, Madam Chair. You, you know, I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious here. The, the sponsors brought this, this very interesting bill. Now, now of Irish descent, we, we know a thing or two about potatoes. Um, and I've also run some liquor bills. I, I haven't quite figured out, I, I mean, I might be able to be in support if you can show me how we can turn potatoes into some wine. I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in some of that, to, you know, as an amendment. But, you know, as, as we look across this, potatoes serve a fantastic service to the entire ag industry. And, and as we're very fond of hearing our sponsors come down here and talk about ag. I mean, let me tell you about ag. Ag runs everything. And there's the, that urban rural divided ag controls all of it. Ag feeds us. Ag drives the train. And if we don't support it, they might take all of our potatoes away, and then we'll be left starving. So I, I, I'm not sure if this is a, an intimidation tactic on this, this sponsorship of this bill, but I would encourage some thoughtful consideration here, some detailed discussion, and, and maybe I, I'm still looking for my answers if we can create wine out of these potatoes. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm still a pending on this uh, bill. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hear a lot of whining from my colleague in Douglas County, but I do want to inform this chamber of esteemed colleagues that you can make vodka from potatoes, and that is much better to drink with a little orange juice, also an agricultural product. Representative Freiburg, I mean Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor, a privilege, and I'm grateful to be serving with you. Fellow colleagues, five daughters, Five, one, three, five, it's cowboy math. When I wake up in the morning, I do some spuds and potatoes and grab some horses. My hip gets in the way every now and then. It's all right. Just want to tell you, it's all very privileged. It's a good, good build. You know, you should all vote yes. I can speak for another jolly good horses come home for 25 minutes. 
But I don't think so. We'll wait for the sheep to come home and we'll go look at them and shear them and put them in the pasture. Potatoes. Potatoes. This is why we're running this bill. Potatoes. You have a good day now, you hear? Representative Armagost. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. When we're up here talking about taters, <laughs> this morning I had me some tater soup. We had, uh, I call them papas. But uh, some of you might know them as potatoes or potatoes. But uh, to the bill, Madam Chair, I, I do respect you and thank you for your leadership and your sacrifice standing back there at that podium with the state seal on it. <laughs> when we're, we're talking about uncertified potatoes. Those are potatoes that are not certified. <laughs> and we're up here, we're not talking about that in particular, we're talking about the planting of those taters throughout the eastern plains of Colorado. We do have our colleagues in the other parts of San Luis Valley where uh, we see taters coming from, and we do make, we do make a lot of different meals and accoutrements with, with our taters. And uh, I don't know the word for that in Spanish, but I, I will look it up and come back at a later time. But to the bill, <laughs> when we are talking about the planting of, side note, uh, if you've ever had a 450 pound hog fall on you, uh, it, it will crush your pelvis, and it's hard to lean over a podium like this without raising it up and not lowering it back down for other people. But to the bill, there are uncertified potatoes that we don't use in our soups and our, our side dishes, our french fries. Uh, but we will, we will regulate those and how and where they can be planted and when, uh, because I, I will let other colleagues come up and talk about the danger of uncertified potatoes and how we do or do not plant them in certain places. So I, I will yield the rest of my time to my colleagues. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representatives Soper and Tatone. Members, uh, we just Representative wanted, Soper. Oh, thank Excuse you, Madam me. Chair. I apologize. We just wanted to come down here and talk about this bill because, as you know, being from the West Slope and the Front Range, there's potatoes grown in our districts. Pretty sure your district. But we are um, ones that are really concerned about uncertified potatoes. And certainly, I wanted to come down here and talk about some of my favorite potatoes that, uh, oh, by, by the way, it's lunchtime, so we, we, we brought our lunch with us because it's, it's, <laughs> it's lunch, it's lunch, but while everyone else is eating lunch and I can see it, I did want to mention it's a few of my hungry. favorite uncertified potato dishes that do fit under the title. So baked potatoes, chips, crisps, french fries, mashed potatoes, funeral potatoes, Nochi, for all our Italian members. Representative Soper, thank you. Uh, oh, there's, there, there's more to this list, Madam Chair. I'm not quite done yet. So we have potatoes au gratin, hash browns, home fries, boiled potatoes, potato soup, pate aux pommes de terre. That's a personal favorite, given my French connection. Potato bread. Some people this afternoon are going to be hearing a bill that's going to drive them to enjoy potato vodka. There's also potato pancakes, potato salad. I really love potato salad this time of year. Potato scallops. Putin, for all of our Canadian friends, and um, raclette, 
for our Swiss friends. And th those are just the beginning of the list. I know it just goes on and on. We, uh, we can actually make almost anything you want out of potatoes. And we, we do right here in Colorado. But I'm concerned that a lot of these might be uncertified. Mm. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, there's been a really good roasting on these potato bill so far, and I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, I don't know about you, but I like potatoes, certified Colorado potatoes in particular. And this should be an appealing bill to you, really. There's no need to butter you up on this. I'm sure I, I will ask for an I vote because they grow on potatoes. Eyes grow on potatoes. Uh, I am a yes on this bill. <laughs> <laughs> We're not dividing potatoes. But you know what? This bill needs a little something more, and we are going to pay homage to the pommes de terre. Uh -huh. And for that reason, I move Amendment L003, a demande cul suite affiché, which means ask you to be displayed. This changes the title of the short title of the bill to the Certified Potato Act. And I ask for your support for the Certified Potato Act. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I appreciate this amendment. I do feel like it needs a substitute amendment. So I move Amendment L002 and ask that it be properly displayed. The amendment has been properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members. I really want to change the short title to adequately address what this bill is all about. It really is the Mr. Potato Head bill. And as we dug into this a little bit more, we wanted to check about the IP. We also discovered Mr. Potato Head is uncertified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, just uncertified. So it, it, it actually fully fits with the bill. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, Mr. Potato has in the public domain, so we can talk about him all we want. But this will be the Mr. Certified Potato Planting Act, and I would ask your support for this mm -hmm. because he is a certified potato now that he's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Members, the motion before us I is the passage of Amendment L002. <laughs> Are we doing this? <laughs> seeing no further, no, there's, there's, seeing no further discussion, there's, there's, all those in favor. Oh, excuse there me, Representative comment. Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since there is no confirmation whether Mr. or Mrs. Potato Head is certified or uncertified, we're going to request a no vote. <laughs> uh, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Although do I appreciate the amendments and the hijacking of the bill title by those that are taterly concerned about uh, potatoes, I would recommend a no vote because this came from the potato growers and they have not been properly um, notified of these amendments. So um, I would also encourage a no vote. Representative Bradley. Thank you. I would just like to thank Sober for the amendment uh, because now we know where he spends all of his time and why we can't find him ever in the Republican caucus. Thank you. There does seem to be concern about smashing of the House rules, and I will invite our amendment sponsors to come back up to the microphone. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Considering um, you know, some of the rules, we um, will withdraw this amendment. Yeah. Thank you. At the please, sponsor's please withdraw request. Both, both amendments, <laughs> both of them, please. We need you to... Oh. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I withdraw Amendment L002. And I withdraw Amendment L003. The amendments will be withdrawn. Is there any further discussion on Senate Bill 24-137? Representative Evans. 
Thank you, colleagues. And as you guys know, when I'm down in this well, I, I try to do a good job of sticking to the bill. So I'm going to uh, tailor my comments to the bill because I really do want this conversation to be rooted in reality. And I hope that the argument that I'm about to make will grow on you. And so I, I really don't want to uh, sputter when I, when I say this. <clears throat> because I think when we read the title of this bill here and we look at the broader environment in which this bill is brought, there's a very important argument that hasn't been raised yet. And that is, if you take a potato and you shoot a firearm through that potato, that can suppress the sound, which I believe subjects these potatoes to the definition of a firearm accessory. <laughs> and so I would ask for an I vote on this particular piece of legislation so that we don't have uncertified firearms accessories running around. Thank you. Representative Rutenell. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. You know, Mama always said, life is like a sack of potatoes. You never know what you're going to get. I reckon there's at least a dozen different ways to make a potato. You can bake it. You can mash it. You can make it like the French. You can hash it. Anyways, uh, folks, I urge an I vote. Let's, uh, I think we, we're done with this whole bit, right? We can just get done with this. That's it. Uh, apparently not. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're done, right? I have a potato casserole recipe, and it involves tater tots. They're frozen. It's, of course, it also involves a can of cream of mushroom soup. But I need to know if the tater tots that are frozen are certified or uncertified. Point of clarification from the bill sponsors, please. Oh, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. And everybody in this chamber knows how much I like to talk about agriculture. So, what you need to know is for consumption, it doesn't matter if you're potatoes or potatoes or taters or tatos are certified or uncertified. It's still a potato. What really matters is in planting that those potatoes are certified so they are free of any kind of fungus or any time, type of any, any other type of virus, fungus, or anything that would preclude them from growing up from a little sprout to a healthy tater that you can eat in your house. So it really doesn't matter, don't be concerned, the Colorado potatoes with this bill will be some of the best, most certified potatoes in the house. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, Amendment L004 and ask that it be properly displayed. Amendment L004 has been properly displayed. Representative Clifford. I agree with Rep Holtorf. I do believe that through the bill we should replace potato with potato. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on Amendment L004? Representative Martinez. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. We like the original definition, and we feel that it is very critical to the passage of this bill and statute, so we are going to request a no vote. Representative Clifford. Madam Chair, I withdraw the Amendment L4. Amendment L004 is regrettably withdrawn. Representative Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the bill sponsors for bringing this. And um, we all know this author, the author of Winnie the Pooh, had a really good quote that I think should sum this up about the two individuals that ran this bill. What I say is that if a fellow really likes potatoes, he must be a pretty decent sort of fellow. Vote yes. <laughs> 
Is there any further discussion on Senate Bill 24-137? Representative Catlin. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a gas to hang out with you. Uh, and a gas <laughs> to hang out with you, Representative Catlin. Thank you. Thank you. All this fun, I don't know, I, uh, I'm not sure I can handle it this close to lunch. But one of the things that didn't happen was nobody came down here and said, let her rip, tater chip. <laughs> so I thought I'd finish it up with something like that. It seems like they did let it rip, but they, did, they missed the point. We're gonna export these potatoes back to the mother of the potatoes. That's what certified potatoes are for so that we can send them around the world and have those, that kind of quality of potatoes being sold and grown all over the world. Uncertified is a problem. But I really want you to think about that. This is a good bill. We need to, we need to move it forward. But you know, I just, I didn't have my eyes on this morning when we started talking about this. And some of these jokes almost gave me a tuber and I can feel it deep in me that I'm getting a tuber from some of this jocularity. <laughs> you know, the only thing it probably really needed was, a, you know, at least a dollop of gravy because, you know, I just can't hardly eat potatoes without a gravy. So anyway, I want you all to know I appreciate the jocularity and the humor about agriculture, but don't forget, we can't make it without it. We need them three times a day. Thank you. Good bill. Vote yes. Is there any further discussion on Senate Bill 24-137? Going once, going twice. All right. And the, so the motion before us is the passage of Senate Bill 24-137. All of those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. And the eyes, of course, have it. Uh, Senate Bill 24-137 is passed. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Move the committee rise and report. <laughs> oh. Seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report.
the House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report it is under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1378 is amended and 1383 passed on second reading ordered in gross and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 137 passed on second reading ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Parenti. Thank you. Members, you've heard the motion. The question before us is the adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Representative Brown. Representative Brown is excused and he owes us $5. Please close the machine. With 41 aye, 18 no, and six excused, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Additional announcements. I do want to mention that Everyone in this chamber had a lot of fun with potatoes, and the sergeants asked if we could run an amendment, is it potato or potato? So thank you, sergeants, for playing along. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. No, Representative Byrd. And I was out. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, um, I am just noticing again that um, JBC will be meeting again um, after we adjourn here to begin our work again as First Conference Committee on um, House Bill 1430. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Oh, sorry, announcements, subs. Representative Mabry will replace Representative Kipp on finance for today only. And Representative Brown will, will replace Representative Joseph on finance for today only. My apologies. Now, Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over the balance of the calendar to Friday, April 12th, 2024. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until Friday, April 12th, 2024. Madam Majority Leader. I move that the House stand in recess until later today. The House will stand in recess. Oh. Uh, the House. Uh, I withdraw that. <laughs> my, my apologies. I accidentally said we were meeting in the old Supreme Court earlier. Energy Environment is meeting right over in the old State Library, a much better chamber, uh, you know, meeting room. So thank you. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Thank you, Representative Kipp. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Re members, a reminder that we will be starting at 8.30 tomorrow, not 9 o'clock, 8.30. And with that, I move that the House stand in recess until later today. The House will stand in recess until later today.